Hello there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Last episode finished with West Country veteran angler and journalist Mike Millman filling in some of the personal details of the charter skippers responsible for providing so many great fish and also for helping so many top anglers make their name. Here in part two, we now look a little bit more closely at the West Country itself. So what then for you are the key identifiable ingredients that have allowed this end of the English Channel to be so fish prolific? Is it the terrain, the climate, the quality of its boat skippers, or perhaps a combination of all these factors and more? It's basically the number of wrecks that we've got here. As I said to you before, there's over 400 known ones in Lime Bay. This is Lime Bay, by the way. You're looking at it. But all the way down the English Channel, it's full of wrecks. And you had the right commercial skippers in the main, not totally, to take advantage of it because of the electronics. From a record point of view, I don't think anywhere else in Britain even comes remotely close to it. I don't think so. Yeah, but other areas also have big numbers of wrecks, but without the same quality of fish on them. The southwest is particularly rich in big fish. I mean, if you go back through the years, I mean, there have been some incredible fish that dwarf anything that we know about, like a 120-pound ling and things like that, caught off the sillies on a long line. A man who um, had a big influence on the fishing at this time, particularly for um, off the bottom fish, was Alex Ingram. Some Mevigas eels, red gills. Alec, of course, was a, a great innovator. I mean, I knew him very, very well indeed. A great innovator. Most of these big pollock, big coal fish and so on, fell to one of the other types of his artificials, made principally in a shed in Mevigizzi, overlooking the sea. You can smell that, you know, the, the vinyls and all that kind of thing. But of course he got into that by accident, you know. He was pretty badly shot up during the war. He was in tanks. He told me quite a number of stories about that, um, buried his brother along the side of the road. And then he was shot up pretty badly. Before that, he had a reputation for being a, quite a gunner. He used to ricochet him off. He got the idea from Nelson. And by in the, the German tanks, he used to find you could kill more of them by ricocheting the, the shell off the ground. And He's a good artist, you know. And some of his paintings are in the Imperial War Museum. I've got a couple of copies of them that he gave me, actually, um, of the the Battle of Alamein. I wish they were originals, but it showed exactly what it was. But anyway, he was very badly injured. Very badly injured. He shot up. And he woke up looking at a stained glass window. And he thought he'd gone to heaven. <laughs> in fact, he was in a church that had been turned into a temporary hospital. But anyway, he got into the the casting purely to repair the shoulder. And he had nothing to do. So he developed these rudimentary eels. And it went on from there. And of course it became big time. Then of course there was the other ones. The, the Eddie Stones came into it. The Dave Beer and so on and so forth. He's still going. But it's quite interesting about how people got into certain elements of all this. Yeah, but Alex Ingram... And another dessert mentioned in terms of Anglian history is the British Conger Club. Yeah, the Conger Club. Formed 1962 by Mike Connell. I'm number 23. And with the exception of possibly one other person, I think he's still alive, I am the elder statesman of the club, which at its peak had 2,000 plus members. That was in the early 90s brought about mostly by the sudden, the advent of, of record fish, like there was no tomorrow, you know, it was being broken frequently. But the club 
um, of considerable stature. Not so much today, because like everything else, it's feeling the pinch of time and money. And that's the problem. It's principally a, always was a boat fishing club. Its championship in the early days was an open affair. Uh, you could enter without necessarily being a member. And then they moved on to heats at ports along the south coast. You had a winner heat to get into the final. The final usually fished from our unity at Brixham. It's been a club that has had most of the big names as members. Most of the big sea angling names have been there at one time or another. It's been close to my heart for uh, the full length of time. I started off on the committee. I became its social secretary, handling as many as 300 people at the annual general meeting weekends, um, of which we quite often held them in Torquay, we held them here, we held them there, and so on and so forth. I can tell you an amusing story about one of them that we held at a hotel in Torquay here, 300 people. We had a, a booking from a chap called a disc jockey. Let's just say he was a disc jockey. The names don't matter. And he had made the booking for two of them to come. It was him, and we assumed it was his wife or lady friend or something like that. On the Sunday morning, I looked at my list to see who had paid and who hadn't, and realised that they hadn't paid. So I go up to the room and knock on the door. The fellow answers it and says, yeah, I said, I don't wonder if it. Packing up now, you know, and I wonder if it could square up the hands. Oh, he's coming. Says a voice. So in I go, sitting up in bed, this lady. Oh, what is it? She said. I said, well, it's good. Said, oh, said to I'm in the checkbook. So he goes and gets the checkbook. At that moment, another chap comes out of, out of the bathroom. So now we got three of them there instead of two. Anyway, she wrote the check. And that was that. A little while later, she went to prison for a very long time for running a certain establishment. There's more to it, which I will not go into. But you did see life that was not quite on the, the schedule. But the club grew in tremendous stature along the years. And, um, well, I think it was Europe's biggest club, from a, certainly from a single species point of view. Yes, of course, over the years, I mean, the, uh, the Congo record has been beaten nine times, to be precise. And there's a few examples over there. There's Hans Clausen up there. 110 pounds, four and a half ounces. Hans died last October. Then, of course, there's uh, Vic Evans, 133, four. The fish, they all want to beat. Of course, Vic's no longer with us, either. He passed away. The other one is Trevor Kerrison, over on the right-hand side there, yes, 111 pounds. And, of course, he was another of these casual should never have had the record, but um, was down here on a trip with a party. And, of course, lo and behold, he's the guy that, that gets the big one, breaks the record. That, actually, that particular fish was recently used in one of the River Monsters series on television. Jeremy Wade. Yeah. They did a thing about eels. So they took two or three of my pictures to show how big they get here. Yeah, it was an era of excitement. The one that you pointed out, the one that you recalled, with it over his shoulder, that's Billy Oaten. 95-6, just missed the 100, but of course it was a very early on one. And Billy, I said to him, would you mind putting that fish round your neck? Not for one minute thinking that he would agree to do that. And there was the result. <laughs> That's a picture to remember. Yes. That picture, actually, caused some interest in America. 
and it was used in an advertising shot. <laughs> the one down the bottom, of course, is the... Uh, Brian bought £109, that fish can be seen today at um, Veals in Bristol. It was mounted. Vic Evans, one at the top, of course, is down at the Brixham Club. And the British Conger Club had a replica of it made, which we presented to the International Game Fish Association in Fort Lauderdale. And it hangs with all the other world and records and notable fish in the Hall of Fame. As a matter of fact, as a point of interest, all this stuff is destined for the IGFA. I promise it to them, all of it, all the archive, of which will take a considerable amount of space. Well, whoever's going to do it will have to ship it over there. But I promised it to them and it's all going to go into the library. And the books. I've got a huge collection of books. I've got rid of a lot, but the notable ones, it'll all go across to the States. All these features, all the new stuff. But to come back to the Conga Club, we started to do a yearbook 18 years ago. I took on the editorship of it after um, one year, which wasn't that great, but I took it on. And those are all the front covers they are all championship fish. I'm the earliest winner in the middle there, look, in the front, with Jeff Flores, who's won it twice. But the club has gone from greatness to a steady decline, in keeping with all others. Reg, of course, was secretary for over 20 years, did a very good job. A bachelor, of course, he didn't have any uh, encumbrances. At one time, the Conga Club was supposed to be Reg Quest, but uh, he did have a big involvement, of course, and then Tom Matchett took it on. Very good administrator. But it's been good to be a member. I started on the committee. I became, as I said, social secretary. I could have had the chair years before, but I was already holding the chair of at least three other organisations, so that wouldn't have been a sensible thing to do. But ultimately, I became... Vice Chairman, then I became Chairman, and they honoured me with the Presidency three years ago. So we've had a, a bit of a round robin. So I'm, I'm quite pleased about that, really. Yeah, a good club, with stature. Of course, we followed on. You see, the, the other club, which is gone, of course, which um, was in keeping with the Shark Angling Club of Great Britain and the British Conga Club, was the Tunny Club, which... Uh, Ended, of course, around about 1966, something like that. Mostly in your part of the world, Scarborough and Whitby. I was fortunate enough about 18 months ago to record an interview with Bill Pashby over at Scarborough. Bill was the last surviving person to have actually taken part in the tunny fishing and had manned the oars when many of the really big fish were caught over there. But unfortunately, like the tunny club itself, Bill is sadly no longer with us either. I wrote the history of the Tully Club, the British Tully Club, which has been in a few places, but it's in um, one of the um, Conga Club yearbooks. But of course, they've got all that stuff up in the Scarborough Museum. It's a wonderful display there. And um, they've got John Edley Lewis's fish, which beat the record by a pound, but isn't the British record because it was weighed with a wet rope. Actually, you know, it was all this business of tunny fishing and all that kind of thing, and Zane Grey and so on and so forth, that got me interested in most of um, the tripping and all that kind of thing. And I thought, well, I wouldn't mind going where they went, the big people. So I have. I mean, I sat on the balcony in Catalina where Zane Grey wrote uh, some of his narratives, and I sat where Hemingway sat, where he wrote Islands in the Stream, walked the same docks that... Zane Grey walked in the 1920s, all the stories of the tunny. And eventually, of course, I wound up at the International Tunny Match, where I was the guest of uh, that for five years. Fantastic. Met so many of the top names. Kip Farrington, first man to catch a thousand pound fish. Became a good friend, wrote me a lovely intro to his book, The Trail of the Sharp Cup. 
I treasure that sort of thing. Alfred de Salle, the man who holds the world record for um, the Black Marlin. When I was over there last time, President of the FA just said to me, oh, Mike, you're just too late. I was just talking to Alfred, and he sent his best regards. Yeah, they've all gone, of course. They've all died. But anyway, the Sharp Cup, qu quite a thing, you know. Um, the people that were there were um, remarkable, really. Talented anglers. The stories. Juan Posada, he was one of the Mexicans. Mexican team, they won it two or three times. Do you remember that detective? Big detective? What was he called in a television series? In, a, in the States. I forget what he was called now, but anyway. He looked like that. I was out on the boat with him one day. I knew he ranched, and I said to him, Juan, how big's the ranch? How my I don't know. Takes two hours to fly over it in the Cessna. A fairly big ranch. I happened to be there quite a few years later, in the week that the present world record tune of 1645 was called. I was taken down to meet the guy. And I did the pictures. Cancel Causeway. I have a big one to my own credit. It's um, over nearly three hours. But I still regard my best fish as a 120 pound tarpon. One handed or one armed, if you like. I had a fairly operation on an arm. I had a cancerous bloody thing, you know. Too much sun. But anyway, so I had it taken out. And the surgeon said to me, do nothing with that for the next six to eight weeks. So three weeks later, I find myself in uh, Florida in the past fishing for tarpon, as it would be, wouldn't it? I hooked a good one, you see. It took a long time, but it was a beautiful fish. It was five, five and a half feet. Oh, tip five and a half, tip uh, 49 around you, which made him 120 pounds. Saw him go. Don't want to kill him. I got a picture of it. They took a picture of us. I was doing it, but um, the tuna match, though, was a wonderful experience of the big time. All the big names that were there. I mean, it was done so beautifully well. I remember the um, the teams each year would put on a, a social evening, which they were responsible for. I remember the the year the Germans put on one, flew in a plane with a German baroness as the hostess, and with all the German foods that was flown up from New York, with all the German types of food. It's how to do it, for real. Wonderful. And Mexico um, always used to put on, especially in the F girls up and dancing and Mexican stuff and tequila and all this kind of thing, you know. Presented everybody with a, a memento, of which I have a cupboard full. We should show them, but we never do. And then one year they gave me a beautiful, a beautiful knife with my name already inscribed on it. But it takes money to do these things. But they were thoughtful money. I never found them anything other than nice. One year, we had a guy called Gibson, who was a lumberjack. And he had broken the bluefin tunny record. So they invited him to fish on the American team. I'd been out with him on the boat, just by luck. He came back. He was standing at the um, reception desk at the Grand Hotel in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. And the girl behind the bar said, Oh, Mr. Gibson, there's an uh, envelope for you. I remember him saying, I said, Hell, nobody else was going to write to me from the bloody backwards of some or other. Open the envelope. And there was a, a wad of hundred dollar bills. What do I do with it? I said, You put it in your pocket. See, somebody had noticed that whilst he was a member, of the national team, he didn't have the stature or the money of his compatriots. Now, one of the other of them had noticed that. There was $1,500 in the envelope. Now, that probably meant absolutely nothing 
to whoever had put it in there. It could have been a thousand, it could have been two thousand. But somebody was thoughtful to enable him to stand his corner. And that's the type of people basically they were. Can we now start to look at your involvement with a great long list of British records? You know, of course, that um, I did a lot of news um, pictures yes. all over the place, you know, here, there, and God knows where. And, of course, I was with BBC Television for 12 years, for over 600 programmes, most of which I directed. Wonderful times. Took me to a lot of places, met a lot of people. We've just had the BBC's 50th anniversary in Plymouth, to which I was one of the guests, and that was really good. Angela came down, she's my era, of course, you Scully, all good friends. Yep. Right, so we're going to talk about the records. The easy way to do that, Phil, is to pull up this book, this one here, and just trot through some of them visually. Then I'll remember which ones you might want to talk about additionally. Now, earlier, of course, we talked about JJ, didn't we? We did. Well, there he is on the day he caught his anglerfish of £74.8. ounces. That was the day. I mean, it looks a bit older than that today when we see him. Just a touch. He's not bad, though. The irrepressible Roy Slater. He arrived on our doorstep six o'clock in the morning. So I hope the breakfast is on. Say, yeah, all right, Roy, what have you got? I got this. Show me this bass. Sat down, ate his breakfast. Went back up on the hole and did the pictures. Then we went in and got it positively identified, and so on. You know, all the, all the rigmarole. There's John Garlic with the black bream. This still stands. 1977, £6.14. Got him a trip to Mexico. And there's the red bream. That's the one I would like to catch. £9, 8 ounces, 12 grams. Brian Reynolds. There's a story... And I'm not going to tell you. Hell of a fish. Only two ever in nine pounds. One in Ireland and that one. You're not going to tell us? The bigger ones in Gibraltar. There's Chris Bradford with the present Guildhead Bream record. That's the boat record. 9.15.8. Of course, again, you see, commercial in has had a tremendous effect upon the stock of Guildhead Bream both down in the Hale Estuary, in the Fowl Estuary, and particularly at Sulcombe, where there was a big resident population, and they've nailed them all. So you don't get many now. And there's the shore record, 10-5, Chris Carr. He was a junior then, when he caught that. Dave Brown, with his record call, which still stands, 37-5. Quite a big fish. And there's Jordy with the crewman and the fish. Because the fish was caught from artillerymen, you see. Tony Harris for the Colfish, because there was a succession of these things. Colfish, £30.12, 1971. Um, moving down, the good story about this one. This is Dave Cook with the Colfish from the shore of £20.06. That's 1982. And the story about that one is that the a tackle shop in Wadebridge offered, obviously through an insurance, a prize of £5,000 for a British record fish caught with one of their rods. So Dave Cook buys the rod on Friday afternoon and on Saturday morning at a place called Pier Sellers, Newquay, catches that British record coalfish. So I went down and did the picture. But he had to get the £5,000. So it was agreed that it would be a ceremony in Weybridge. Set it up. 5,000 quid. Champagne. And we waited. And we waited. Because there ain't no sign of the erstwhile cook. Didn't have a telephone. So somebody had the bright idea of ringing the local police down at Newquay, where he lived. Said, here, could you go around and knock him up? See if he's there. He was still in bed, fast asleep, because he'd been fishing the night before and forgot all about the fact that he is going to collect £5,000. We had all the television there. They all got fed up and went. My crew stayed. 
so we added exclusive. But the most valuable fish in terms of cash, really. This one could have broken the record. You're talking about Lou again. It's a guy called Yanni Jordan Upulo. He was the manager of the Bank of Athens. He used to come down and stay at Lou for six weeks of every year. This particular year, he caught this fish, which was from the Eddystone Reef, and it would have beaten H.A. H. Kelly's record of £84 by £2, because it weighed £86. Way down the line, 60 years then, I interviewed his widow down at Kingsbridge, and she told me the story of it all and all that kind of stuff, but um, that's Chid Hoskin. Frank Hoskin used to yeah. run the tackle shop. I know him well, yeah. That's his father, and that's the fish, and there's Yanni. Jordan up, you know. And I traced him through the Bank of Athens. Asked him, said, have you got a pensioner called? It's in, I don't know, who's asking? Blah, blah, blah. Why? We'll get back to you. And they did. Said, yeah, okay. I remember it. She's obviously not a terrorist, so we'll tell you where you can find her. And they did. And that was the unity one that I showed with all those oh, yeah. years of the records. There's the badge of our unity. There's Vic with 133-4 which, of course, is the target. Of course, he had a unique way of fishing, you know, with a coat hanger. His trace was a, a wire coat hanger, always, because he maintained that it transmitted every touch that the conger put to it, because the hook was on the coat hanger. But it worked... I mean, the day he caught that, it was only that he was fishing for himself in the middle of it all. And there's the fish down at Brixham, mounted. There's my picture of it there. Nine foot. Big eel. And there it is, on its way to the States, where it hangs in the Hall of Fame. It's the second biggest of all time, 115, not a record, but I felt it was worth including Bristol chap, Sean Truman's. And there's the shore record, Martin Larkin, 66-8. You'll remember I mentioned that Devil's Point where they used to throw the stones down on us and we had to squeeze around. Well, that's where he caught that. 68-8. There was a bigger one from the Tamar, but the guy didn't weigh it for 24 hours, so missed out foolishly. Some line class records, 101-2, 20 pound, refused by the RJFA. I took it up with them specifically when I was over there personally, but I couldn't swing it because they reckoned that he hadn't followed the rules. There's Neil Ball with the conger from Lloyd Saunders' uh, 112.8. And there's Robin Potter with 109.6, 1976. Two other of the records. That's um, Del Mash, which equaled Niall Ball's 112.8. And there's Terry Kerrison, the one I told you about just now, £111. And that one's the one that's just been featured on River Monsters, uh, Jeremy Wade's thing. That's the record flounder, 576, 578, but not, that's the shore fish. The other one, of course, the 5, 511, which is cobbled it from the, the yeah. foy, that still stands. And that was another of the records, 5-3, Neil Burgess from the teen, when the teen used to fish well. And that was the other one from there, Bill Stevens, 5-2, with Terry Walker. And that was the Ling, of 46 pounds, that broke H.C. Nichols' fish of 1912. You mentioned about Ray Parsons. There he is with uh, Brian Oden, the Ling of 50 pounds, Eight ounces, 1974. You mentioned the Honkins. There's Les with Henry Solomon's Ling of 57.2, 1975. Oh, Bill Chappell's Mackerel of 6.2, 1984. That's the shore one. Morris Kemp, 5.11.4. You're looking at the mark. Oh, no. Right opposite us. Berry Head. We talked about JJ. There were the three big fish on that day. There's the... The record fish, 25 pounds. That was the coal fish of 26 something. 
and that was mine. Coalfish there, I had there of 22 on that day. Memorable day. That was um, Milkins Pollock, 27-6, 1986. It's another one from the J eras. Okay, Mark Wills with the Electric Ray, 58-12 off the shore. This one gave him a shock. That's Norman Cowley's Electric Ray, 96-1, 1975. They didn't know what they had, so they got hold of it. <laughs> yeah, gave him a real shudder. Tony Martinez, Small Eyed Ray, broke the record. And there's Hetty with her Mako 352, 500 pounds, 1971. Right, now we come to the story here. George Pottier's then world record, poor Beagle, 465 pounds. I could do nothing with it because it was in such a bloody state. And it was in a state because there was no water and the tide was out and you weren't allowed to use a tap or a hose pipe. But he brought that huge fish down from Padstow, stuffed in the back of a brand new shooting brake. You have never seen anything like it. Drove down and got it photographed and got it away. I literally threw the whole roll of colour film away. There was nothing you could do with it. I just chucked it. You can see the state of it. And that was Derek Runnels. He could have broken that record if only he'd got down to the scales. 458 after 24 hours. I brought the scales up from Lou. I went and collected the scales, took them up to Padstow, and we photographed it there. It then weighed 458, and there was uh, 32 pounds of water in the bottom of the container. Quite an unusual one. Alan Pasco, Big Eyed Tunny from the Wall at Newlin, 66 pounds 12. Saw it swimming around there for a few days, and had a go for it and caught it. Interesting fish. Turbo. Paul Hutchings, he was a junior then. He was uh, 11 or 12, something like that. 31-4, 1972. That set going the off the centre line fishing for turbot when the boats drifted off the rails right, yeah. down the side. Yeah. But they didn't do that originally. As soon as it drifted off, all up, Paul Hutchings. Day to remember. Derek Dyer, turbot, 32-3 on the same day. His mate had won 31 pounds, which equaled the record. There they are together. And the present record, of course, is held by Roger Simcox, 33-12. And that's from the Salcombe Estuary. That's Neil Croft's whiting of 6-12-8, which was beaten only three months ago. The fish of 7-4 off Plymouth. That was the card from our Unity, 53. And that's not a record, but by God. Four double-figure bass. In one session, from the shore, a Mount Batten jetty in Plymouth. With so many fish already witnessed, photographed, and in some cases incumbent in the record list now, how do you see the specimen fish future for this corner of the world? Well, from the point of view of participation, it has dropped quite dramatically. The number of people that are now coming down to the west ports to fish has lessened quite considerably. And that, of course, is due to the cost of fuel, the cost of overnight accommodation, meals and so on. I mean, it's probably a £200 weekend, isn't it? And not everybody is uh, willing to spend that. Not everybody has got that kind of money to spend. And that's a problem. And that has been reflected in the, uh, the number of uh, people in clubs and things. It's all lessened. Where that's going to go, I don't know. We may have reached perhaps a bottoming where the people that are still coming are wealthy enough to be able to continue to do so. The incident of record-breaking fish has quite clearly lessened dramatically. Over the years, I mean, the, uh, the amount of uh, commercial fishing has increased beyond all measure, and they're mopping up vast numbers of fish of virtually every species that you can think of it now has a value no matter how poor you may consider it to be they'll call it something else and do something with it so i don't really feel that the future is that bright really clubs are having a hard time they are losing memberships 
It's also a fact, of course, that the younger person, perhaps, isn't quite as keen on club life, um, of that type of thing, as we were. Too many other electronic home-based attractions, or should I say, distractions. Exactly. The juniors aren't coming through. Whereby, in the old days, each club had a thriving junior section, and I can think of one or two clubs with over a, a hundred juniors. I know of one that had a membership, a junior membership of about 80, that now has three. And they will lose them as soon as they become 16. So that's a serious downside, isn't it? So I don't quite know what the answer to that is. Unless, of course, as with everything, it goes in circles or cycles or whatever you want to call it. And it may be somewhere down the line. But I've got doubts about that, to be honest. I think that saltwater angling has a limited future. As sad as that might be, if you wanted to get slightly controversial, the Angling Trust, of course, is taken over from the NFSA, it's taken over from this and taken over from that. The reality is, of course, that it is not truly representative of all disciplines. It likes to think that it was going to become that, but it hasn't. And I see that through the number of emails that we get, probably from for every 20 or 30 that we get from them, one or two may have some bearing on salt water. And then whatever that is, it's usually periphery or something that they've dreamt up, something to make you feel. Because I have criticized this very heavily, that you are too concerned with elements that are of no great national interest. And they're concentrating, of course, on competitions within the course world, the fisher mania thing, all that. All right, there are competitions that don't deserve the kind of coverage that they're giving them. My opinion. I have been critical of it since the very beginning, which they well know. And um, a lot of what I said has very much come to pass. There's no doubts about that. But unless it becomes more representative, I don't really see where it's going to uh, benefit the salt water. So the best of it has now gone. I would say so. Well, I've certainly seen the best of yep. it. There's no question of that. But nevertheless, I mean, there are still are still enthusiastic bodies. I would mention the Cornish Federation of Sea Anglers, which um, I've been close to for many years. Uh, they kindly invited me to present the 50th anniversary uh, prizes and all that kind of thing. Uh, they reminded me that I'd been down there, I don't know, God knows how many years. And that is thriving quite well. It's got 38 clubs, and it seems to have the ability to stave off what is happening elsewhere. It could be, of course, that Cornwall, <laughs> you know, is a foreign land. They are different, down here, I'll tell you that now. You get across the Tamar. And it's different. And the further west you go, the difference becomes greater. In summary then, looking back over an extremely long and successful angling career, spanning what has to be the golden age of West Country fishing, what for you is the single defining highlight? Sheer involvement and pleasure. I've worked in it for 40 years, as for myself. And I cannot honestly say that I've... Yes, there may have been just one or two periods when you would have rather not had that or this. But generally speaking, it's been the life that I wanted to live. And there won't be too many people out there who can honestly say that. No, I gave up a very, very good position at the age of 40. Hence the 40 years that I've worked for myself to purely work for myself. I couldn't quite see where the future was of doing what I was doing. And one sentence really decided me. And that person said, a desk is waiting for you at head office. And I thought, oh no, it's not. I was offered a sales managership of a one of the bigger areas in Britain, at the age of 26, which was unheard of. 
in the era that I am referring to. This is the 50s. And to their surprise, horror, and so on, they t- I turned it down. The usual thing came, if you turn it down, you will never be offered again. And they kept offering too many times. And until one day, in a fit of weakness, I took one of the positions. But I'm afraid it was the turning point where I realized that that was going to be a life of purgatory. In comparison to what I wanted to do, and I've always been my own man, really, and I think that it's paid off. And I've been lucky. Let's not get away from that. You've got to be lucky as well. And I have been. And I've had tremendous support. And that's the whole thing. My wife has never stopped me from doing anything I ever wanted to do. And before the children were big enough to be left, I mean, I travelled the world on my own. And she never complained, never. And, and I don't think there's many would be like that. I'm sure you're right. To be honest with you, you know. And like a single one or two. We've, we've been married for 56 years. We hope to make the 60. At the moment it looks all right, but you can never tell what lies tomorrow, can you? So again, it's very much a case of making what you can of today. Because you don't know what's tomorrow. And I feel sorry for the youngsters today. I think they've got a tough time of it. And I think they've got tougher times to come. But they'll work it out, I dare say. We always have. But it's a question of force must, isn't it? But I've certainly enjoyed it. And I think, really, what has made it is the people that you have met along the way. With just the very odd exception, I've been happy with all of them. And, and basically they with me. You, you only get the odd person. You can't be all things to all people, can you? I had one who, and I think this might wrap it up, became quite hostile towards me. And we were reasonably good friends at one time. And I said to him on one occasion, I said, look, I've got to ask you, what the heck is it that I've done that's upset you? And he said, you've been too successful. And I wanted to be what you were. And it was never within the realms of possibility. And I said, well, that's no reason whatsoever to be like that. And he said, Mike, I've realized perhaps it was a bit silly. And he shook hands with me. And we've never had a problem since. For me, and a lot of people, I'll wager, this has been very much a trip down memory lane. But for people younger than me who missed out on the possibility of the experience, I'm sure it's hard to comprehend the sheer quality of the fishing back then and the professionalism of the boat skippers concerned. My thanks then to Mike Millman for taking us on a journey back to those wonderful fish-rich days. (laughs) 